Shalom, shalom Israel, most high in Christ, bless. Most high in Christ, bless. Good morning. Uh, welcome to another edition of Daily Bread. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am Captain Amariah from IUIC of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, all praises to the Most High in Christ. If you guys can see and hear me, if somebody can see and hear me, just let me know. That way I can get class started. Let me know if you can see and hear me just fine. Yuck. Let me see. All right. Okay. Someone just said yes. All right. All praises. All right. Again, Shalom, Most High, and Christ bless. Um, as you see, today's topic is entitled "Remember Your First Love." Remember your first love. All right. Um, this is a class that I've taught numerous times in different contexts, but it always has the the same message. All right. As we prepare for the Day of Atonement next week. I won't get too much into atoning because I'm pretty sure the bishop or deacons are going to go into that this Sabbath, but it's all in the same vein, all right? As we prepare to atone, we have to remember who we are, what we were called to do, and what our first love should be, all right? Letting go of the cares of this world and coming together as a body in Christ to fulfill one goal, and that's to keep the commandments and get the kingdom of God together. All right. So with that, I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, let's go to Revelations chapter two and verse four. All right. Don't mind the bags under my eyes. It's uh, 5 a.m. in Phoenix. I got off work at about 2 a.m., came home, chilled, prepared a class. But that's that goes into remembering your first love, right? The uh, sheep of God come first before anything else. It's an absolute privilege and an honor to be able to tend to God's flock. All right. Uh, Revelation 2 and verse 4. And it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So when Christ was addressing the, the seven different churches, all right, he addressed this particular church and let them know that the thing that he had, had against them was that they forgot their first love. So bring it into context of today's class, that goes for a lot of us in this truth today. And I'm a big, big advocate in examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, right? I would never tell somebody to ensure that you're examining yourself to make sure that you're right with God if I myself am not doing that same thing, all right? Christ was always getting on the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees about being hypocrites. So I would never tell somebody something that I myself wouldn't do. Just like I would never give a class to anybody that I myself don't need to hear as well. So in remembering your forced love, this goes for me first and foremost. When I build my classes, I design my classes on what I need to hear. Because if I need to hear it, just because I've been here almost eight years and I have a title that says captain, doesn't mean that I don't go through the daily struggles that we all go through together as Israel. The trials, the tribulations, the temptations, all right, the, the falling of shorts, the doubting of our fates. We all go through those things. But that's why we have these scriptures to comfort us. All right. So it says, again, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. From there, let's go to Exodus 20 and verse 8. Exodus 20 and verse 8. So now, let's understand why first and foremost, what our first love is. All right. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Those that are familiar with the the chapter of Exodus 20, that's when the Ten Commandments are, are given to Moses and the nation of Israel, or should I say 
a recitation of them because the commandments have always been around since the very beginning. All right, so we must understand that this was just our people relearning the laws that we had from the very beginning. The same thing that we're doing today, we're just relearning the things that we knew before and we're coming back to our first love yet again. Exodus 20 and verse 8. No, I'm sorry. Uh, and verse, I'm sorry, verse 2. It says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So we know Egypt is synonymous with bondage. It's the same thing that we're doing here in these last days, in this last captivity. We're going to be redeemed from our oppressor and led out of bondage yet again. Verse 3, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So that's the first of the great ten that God gives to the nation of Israel. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Any god before the Most High God is a sin. And that's why he says, I'm a jealous God. Right? We have to understand that if you put your job ahead of serving the Lord, that's having another God before him. If you put any kind of material objects ahead of serving the Lord, that's having another God before him. All right. Idolatry comes in many shapes, forms, and fashions. It's not just so outright as having a picture of white Jesus on your wall. And it's like, okay, that's another God. No, it's anything. If you put your kids before the most high, that's having another God. So our first love needs to be the most high God, the creator of all things, the creator of heaven and earth, all right, the one who's omnipotent and omnipotent and omnipresent in everything. Listen, this is the this is the power that we serve, and this is what we must understand as a people that the most high created everything. He created time for us to be able to have some kind of um that some kind of thing to be able to put into place to where we can uh, align seasons and and feast days and so on and so forth, right? He created the heavens, the earth, everything, all these things. And he's this powerful being that we can't even begin to fathom. And all he wants from us is for us to love him. It's for us to just do what he says, like any father would want from his children. All he wants is for us to come back and serve him in sincerity and truth. The one that created everything that you see, the one that created you, that knows your thoughts, that knows everything about you, ever since you were in the womb, before you were in the womb, he says, I knew thee. And all he wants is for you to come back and serve him. That's all he wants. Think about that for a second. That's heavy. All right. Stay in Exodus. Let's go to 4 and verse 22. Exodus 4 and verse 22. It says, this is Exodus 4, verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So in coming back and remembering our first love, we have to understand that we were his first love. So if we're his first love, then naturally he should be our first love. So the things that are well pleasing unto him and the things that please him in, in any way, just like just like as as kids, how we, when when we would grow up and we would do things that would please our earthly mother and father, and we would see the look of, of pride and and joy in their faces when we did something that was gratifying to them, and we had a sense of pride with that it's the same way that god looks upon us when we shun evil and we put on his commandments because he wants us to get the kingdom but it's not something that's going to be so easily given to just anybody it's the greatest gift that can ever be offered ever you think that's going to come easy it shouldn't all right that's christianity that's that that's fairy tales ha washing the blood of jesus I have faith in Jesus. I, I announce all evil and I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And boom, you get the kingdom. Hell no. That's fairy tales. It's tough. It's a grind. Listen, and the, and the longer you're in this, it never gets easier. It never gets easier. 
it becomes easier to understand certain things and your faith should be increased the longer that, you, that you're in this because you're seeing prophecies come to pass and play out. And it's like, damn, okay. All right. Those things should increase our faith, not diminish our faith. But we all go through things that's going to try us and tempt us in certain ways that it's going to test our faith in a way where like, okay, I know this is the truth, but this lust that is so deeply embedded within me I want to fulfill so bad. So am I going to fulfill this lust or am I going to put on the armor of God? Right? Listen. Again, I've been in this truth in a couple months it'll be it'll be 8 years, right? It'll be 8 years. And I'm more than willing to say that more than half of the day I have the devil on me. More than half of the day. And I'm not saying that I just wake up and I'm like, okay, let's be the devil today. I'm not saying that whatsoever. But I understand that everything in this captivity is designed to keep me in sin. It's designed to pull me out the spirit so that way I can be blotted out of the book of life. We as Israelites, we, we tend to pick and choose when we want to be Israel, right? And I say that meaning... You know, we'll have our little study sessions, but then we'll revert back to old tendencies, right? And the reason why I say the devil's on me half the time is because if I'm driving to work and there's billboards along the freeway of me driving to work, not one of those billboards says, hey, did you rise and face the east today? Did you thank the Lord God of Israel that you're one of his chosen seeds and that he gave you his commandments to keep in the faith of his son? If not, do so now. Not one billboard says that. Every billboard is talking about uh, lust of the flesh. It's talking about things that break the commandments of God. It's promoting activities and events to break God's Sabbath days. So that's what I mean when I say that. I have all this temptation and lust around me. But it's God's commandments that discipline us to shun those things. All right. Let's go to Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So he's letting us know here that Israel is who he loves. Unbeknownst to Christianity and whatever organized religion wants to lie to you and get you to understand and think that God loves everybody, that's not the case. Everybody was created by the Most High God for a particular reason. We were created to serve him. They were created to serve us. It's a trickle-down effect. It's a domino effect. That's how it works. But the reason why things got turned upside down is because we as his children were disobedient. So now we're in a temporary timeout, all right? Anyone that has had parents and broke their laws understand that there was consequences and repercussions to be paid in the household. But guess what? I'm 33 years old now, right? When I got grounded when I was 12 years old because I failed my reading exam and I got grounded and couldn't go outside for the weekend, I can go outside now. It was temporary. It's the same thing with God. Only he don't see time that we see time. So for us, it's been hundreds of years of, of us being afflicted. But for him, he's just kind of taking a nap like, all right, you know what? Go do your thing. Go do your thing. And I'm going to do me. And then, and then we'll get things right. From there, let's go to, let's go back to Revelations 2. Back to Revelations 2. And we'll pick up at verse 5. All right, again, remember your first love. Remember your first love. I always make these classes with myself in mind and what I need my spirit to hear. And Lord's will, my brothers and sisters can glean some kind of edification from it, all right? Revelation 2, verse 5, it says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So now, Christ is explaining to this particular church, just like he's explained to all of us, 
okay? Those of us at one point in time that were without the understanding that we were Israel, and now those of us that are in this walk, and we tend to revert back to old ways, all right? It says, because we forgot our first love, he says, now remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. Remember whence thou art fallen and repent. Let's go to Haggai chapter 1. The book of Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1 and verse, we're going to go to verse 7. Haggai 1 verse 7. All right, there we go. I was going to make a joke about if somebody needed to use their uh, table of contents to do so, but I was this close to having to use it myself. All right, Haggai 1 verse 7. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. All right? So consider your ways, Israel. Consider what you're doing on a daily basis in this walk. Consider who you were and considering who you were trying to strive to become and measure those people whether they align according to the scriptures all right when paul says in second corinthians 13 verse 5 and we're going to get it later i normally start class with that but when he says to examine yourself whether you be in the faith he's saying the the same exact thing that, that the prophet had guys saying all right the prophets never said nothing different. They said things in different ways. It's the same way if Deacon Ithan teaches a class, if Deacon Laba teaches a class, if Deacon Yawasa teaches a class, and then the bishop teaches a class, and they all have the same class title, you're going to get a different message from each class because they all deliver the message differently, right? Same thing with Haggai here. He's saying, listen, consider your ways. What are you about in this walk? Are you about serving the Lord in sincerity and truth, or are you half-stepping? Because remember, Christ said in the book of Revelations, if you're lukewarm, then he's going to spew you out. You can't have one toe in the truth and then one foot in the world. It doesn't work like that with the Lord. He wants all of you or, or none of you completely. Jump up to verse 4. It says, it is time for you, or sorry, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? So now at this time, Haggai was having to get on the men of Israel because they weren't doing the work to restore the nation, right? They weren't putting in the work to rebuild the temple and walls and so on and so forth. So Haggai was getting on them and saying, listen, you guys are here living, living nice and lavish and without a care in the world. But the rest of the nation is impoverished. The rest of the nation need you to do more work to restore us as a people. So now when you fast forward this up to today, understand that the rebuilding of the nation, every single last one of us, men and women, have a brick to put into that spiritual house. All right? Every single last one of us have a brick. Now, our particular bricks do different things, just like they do when you build a physical house, all right? So my brick won't do the same thing as a different brother's brick. His, his brick may be more crucial and important to the foundation of the house, but that doesn't mean that, that my brick that goes up near the roof is not important to hold up the roof of the house. Same thing with the sisters. Understand that you have a vital role in the restoration of a nation of a people. You can't have a nation of just men. That's why when people get on camps for having sisters, I'm like, these, these dudes are ignorant as hell. We encourage our sisters to come, to learn, to apply, to build, to come be women according to the scriptures. All right? So you fast forward this up to this, to this time, and we, ha we have to consider our ways. Are we fully serving the Lord? in sincerity and truth or are we just kind of half stepping and playing israelite on the times that we can be seen or heard and then then we revert back to old tendencies or are we really about this work all right from there let's go to 
Acts 3.19, all right? We have to consider our ways if we're really trying to avoid fulfilling the lust that is so deeply embedded within us, or if we're actually doing things to kind of pick at it a little bit, you know, kind of entertain it. Because if you entertain it, like the scripture says, like a serpent, it's going to eventually bite you. So it's better to flee from it completely. Acts 3 and verse 19. It says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So in the book of Acts, we're being told to repent and be converted. Now, in the Christian church and in the whatever other denominations, they'll, they'll always use the same word, repent. Repent, 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 repent. Nobody knows what repentance really is except for those that are, are repenting Israelites. And I say the word repenting, not repented, because nobody's repented. If, if Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, had to say that he dies daily, meaning he repents on a daily basis, then who the hell are we to say, no, I'm good, I got this. Being born again is a continual process. Understand that. Once you say that you got things right, then you're waiting, then you're asking for the devil to come knock at your door. And it's, it's going to come, and it's not going to be, who is it, devil? Oh, it's not going to come like that. It's going to come in a way that it's going to tempt that lust that's within you, and you're going to entertain it, and you're going to be pulled right back out of the spirit. But it says to repent and be converted. It's not just repentance, although that's a, a step that it's necessary to get salvation, but it's the conversion from the repentance. So you repent from the sins, and now you convert from being that old man or that old woman. All right? Let's get Acts. I'm sorry. Let's get Psalms 19, verse 7. I'm telling you, I write just like a doctor. Chicken scratch. Psalms 19 and verse 7. So let's see what converts us. Let's see what actually converts us from being Sambo Coon, all right? And whatever proverb and byword that we were known as before to now being repenting Israelites. All right, let's see. Psalms 19, verse 7. Because the book of Acts said, repent and be converted. It's, it's a two-way thing. It's not just repentance. It's not just, ha, Jesus, right? It's the conversion as well. It says, Psalms 19, verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The law of the Lord is perfect. We have to understand that. We may not understand the reasoning behind all of his laws, but it's up to us to just be disciplined enough to just follow it. There, there's going to be many of things that you're like, well, why, why, why is that? Why is that? It's kind of like when you, when you first are telling this truth to somebody that has no idea about it, right? And then you tell them that you don't eat pork. And there are things like, oh. You don't eat pork. What do you eat? What do you eat then? And I'm like, okay, there's the pork section, right? And you know how there's the chicken section and the turkey section and the beef section and the lamb section and the bison section. I'm like, I eat, I eat all that stuff. I just don't eat the pork. And they're like, oh, okay. When you when when you narrow it down to its most simplest form, it's really not that difficult to keep. But the scripture says that. A sinful man will find an excuse according to his will. So those that don't want to seek repentance are like, well, when you say that you don't cook from Friday dark to Saturday dark, so you don't eat? That's the first thing. So you don't eat? I'm like, brother, have you ever ate anything that was not cooked? Everyone's answer is no, right? But, okay, so you never had a sandwich before? You've never had a salad before? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I've had those things. Okay, so before it gets dark on Friday, my wife cooks dinner, and we eat dinner together. If I happen to get hungry throughout the night, then I'll have some chips and salsa and a snack or something. The next morning, I'll have cereal for breakfast, and then I'll have a salad and sandwich for lunch. And then, guess what? Oh, my goodness. It gets dark again, and I have a hot meal yet again. And then it's, oh, okay. But again, it's it's the laws of God that convert us, right? Because for me coming in, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I can't eat hot food on the Sabbath? I don't know about this. But once you discipline yourself and become born again, people don't understand. People in Christianity don't, don't understand what Christ really meant when he said be born again. That really means just that. It's literally l learning to live your life all over again. But now you have the rules and guidelines from God to live your life. So he tells you how to dress. He tells you uh, what to eat. He tells you what days to keep. I mean, literally, he gives you the roadmap to success. But we as a people want to be ignorant and we want to go through the construction site. And when there's a sign that says no left turns because there's a construction site, nah, I'm going to make that left turn anyways because I have to turn left here. And then we get pulled over by the police. And then we get a ticket. That's us as a people in a nutshell. All right. From there, let's go to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. One of my favorite scriptures that I normally start class with. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. It says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. So you know yourself better than anyone us or any one of us know you other than the Lord himself. All right. So, you know, your shortcomings, you know what you need to be built up. You know what you need to do to avoid the lust and temptation. All right. You know what you need to not make provisions for the flesh to ensure that you don't jump out the spirit. So when you do, guess what? That's called a willful sin and understanding that the book of Hebrews explains to us that willful sin means that you crucified Christ afresh. That's a heavy judgment that's going to come your way when you willfully sin. So we all have to build up that certain level of fear within us to understand that there is a God and that there is a judgment coming. There is a judgment coming for being disobedient to his commandments. So we need to Make sure that we're in the faith and walking according to how he's instructed us to walk. Again, it's not easy, okay? You think coming in that you would just come in and it'd be all just roses and hugs and kisses and just super shaloms and, oh, man, this is, this is great. And you know what? It is. It really is like that. But then you start going through tribulations. You start losing friends. You start losing family. Listen, when I first came in, now now I have a, a level of wisdom where I can be able to engage in a conversation with somebody that's completely new or even without the understanding of that there is real and give them a, a, a some kind of semblance, similitude to, to what this truth really is without offending them. But when I first came in, it was like, the white man's the devil. Uh, we've been tricked. I mean, it, it sounds like nothing but conspiracy theories because you're so excited that you took that pill to wake you up out of the matrix. Now you're like, oh, my goodness. Everything's a lie. This is a lie. This is a lie. And all you want to do is just cleave on to people that you love and say, listen, we've been lied to. This is the truth. And everyone's like, oh, weren't you just smoking a blunt with me like yesterday? And you're like, yeah, but when I left, I ran into this guy at the store and he gave me a flyer and we're Israel. So you so you come off as sounding crazy as hell, all right? Sounding crazy as hell to people. So I get that. But once you start breaking, I'm sorry, once you start coming into and gaining wisdom and understanding, then it's different. And then you're able to actually examine yourself 
and see where you're at before you start just throwing up on people. All right. Let's go to Acts 17, verse 11. All right. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. It's not just about self-examination because you can self-examine all you want. But if there's no change behind the self-examination, then what was the point of self-examining? All right. I always use the the analogy of of acknowledging that you have the devil on you, right? And you just take the rather than knocking the devil off your shoulder, you take him and say, "Oh, oh my goodness, it's the devil." Here you go. You put him on on this shoulder. What does that do for you? It does nothing whatsoever. It keeps the devil on you because you're just still playing with that sin. All right. What I say, Acts 17 and verse 11. All right, so when we examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, this is how we have to do that. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were true. All right. So studying for ourselves is something that is absolutely vital in this walk. Again. We must study for ourselves to search whether those things are true. For many years, we just sat blind in the Christian church, in the Catholic church, in the Muslim mosque, or just wherever you were. And we just took a man's word at face value and said, oh, well, this guy has a degree and he's wearing the nicest suit and he drives the nicest car. So what he must be saying is true. But we have to understand that we have to raise up to a certain level within ourselves to say, you know what, let me question this real quick. Because before it was just, I believe in Jesus, and now we get the kingdom. But now we understand it's much more than that. It's the application of God's laws coupled with the faith in Christ. So now you want to make sure that you're keeping his laws to the best of your ability because now your soul is on the line. And listen, as much as I love all of my people, Israel, and the scripture says to sigh and cry for the abominations of your people, that's why we go out to the highways and hedges and teach our people. I see my people. Listen, there, there's this Judah brother at work, and I'll use him as, as an example. And I don't get into, into full details at work about things because um i've been fired for <laughs> for things like that so now i have wisdom so now i don't do those things at work but here and there i'll drop little things and he i mean just no fear whatsoever and like he sees us in chicago he sees us in memphis so he comes to me and shows me these things like there was a video that was shared from memphis of last year that has over 10 million views that i took it was just, I was, uh, my my uh, wife had sent me a text and was like, oh, like send me like a video, like show me how many, how many people are there. So I sent her a video. So I just walked in the line, took a video, and sent it to her. That was it. And then we started getting hate from all these people saying that we uh, photoshopped it and not that many people were there. Hate, 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 hate right? So I put it on Facebook and said, all right, for the haters that said that we photoshopped it, here you go. And then it went viral and got like 10 million views. So he's seen that and he's seen all these things that have come come to pass, right? These different things coming. But yet he's like, I'll tell him something. And he comes right back 10 minutes later. He's like, hey, man, I think we're getting a, a, a face tattoo. What do you think? And I'm like, oh, gosh, like this this dude. And he tells me the other day, he says, we're having a conversation for like about 10 minutes and then he comes back and is like, Hey, hey, it's all cool, man. I'll see you in heaven, bro. And I'm like, damn. And he says, and when I see him, I'll be like, nigga, we made it. Ah! And I was, and then I was scared for him at that point. I'm like, man, let me just get away from this dude because he's tempting the Lord for some racks in our warehouse to just fall down and crash and, and crush both of us. I'm like, ah, uh, his, his lack of fear put fear in me to be like, oof, that's not the way that I want to roll in this truth. All right? Not the way. So we must search the scriptures daily. You know what you need? Listen, there's a reason why they call this the book of life. All right? Any question that you have will be answered with this Bible. 
anything that you're dealing with can be dealt with with this Bible. Whatever spirit you have on you that you need to combat can be found in the Bible. You just have to go through it and search it. How important is your salvation to you? That's the question. Because if I gave you the most vague treasure map ever and guaranteed you at the end of it there was a billion dollars, you would do whatever it took to get that billion dollars. But listen, understanding that that's what faith is. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen the kingdom, but we hope that we keep the commandments in the fifth of Christ and we get it. We have the winning lottery ticket. We just can't cash it in yet. That's it. From there, let's go back to Revelations 2 and verse 5 again. Revelations 2 and verse 5 again. Revelation 2, verse 5, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So he says we need to repent and remember our first works. All right? So we cover the repentance. Repentance is not just saying, God, forgive me for my sins. No, listen, first off, the book of Psalms tells you that the Lord likes when you when you say things out loud. So when you pray, you should be praying out loud, right? There's a reason why in the beginning, in the creation, he says, and God said, let there be light, and it was so. He's saying things out loud. He likes that, all right? Um, so we covered repentance. It's not just repenting from things, but it's being converted as well. They're, they're coupled one of the same. Let's go to the book of Hebrews 13, verse 4, when it says, remember your first works. Remember and do your first works. Hebrews 3 and verse 14. I'm sorry. Hebrews 3, verse 14. Hebrews 3 and verse 14. It says, for we are made partakers of Christ." If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. So whenever there's a if, you they let you know that what he just stated before is going to be explained, is going to be what's necessary to get what's said before with what's going to follow what he says. So he says, we're made partakers in Christ. Every single last one of us that pertains to the 12 tribes of Israel, guess what? We are partakers in Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. We have that ticket that no other nation has that we're able to cash in. If, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, that if is necessary for us to understand that Listen, there's just a big stipulation to be a partaker and to get the kingdom. If you hold that confidence steadfast that you had to the very end. Now, when you first came into this truth, brothers and sisters were on fire. I'm talking on fire. Like when I first came in, I said, look, I'm going to treat everything like it's a sin until I learn that it's not a sin. And then I'll then I'll just you know, move on from there. So I came in and I was just super over righteous, right? I'm talking like all I wanted to do was just win, 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 no matter what. It was flyer missions every day. I didn't care about losing jobs. I'm like, I'm keeping my beard. I'm not doing nothing. Pork is the devil. So is the white man. I was on fire for this thing. Not to say that I'm not still on fire, but over a supposition of time, when you when you move up in the ranks or when you're here for a certain amount of time, that fire begins to dwindle for whatever reason, for, for whatever care that comes into your life, all right, that, that, that maneuvers your spirit to the right or to the left for any reason, then that's between you and the Lord. But it's up to you to just remember that fire and passion you had when you first learned it and hold that until the very end because in your patience possess your souls like i'll use me for an example i always use me as an example 
when I teach class because just because I'm on this side of the screen, like I said, and because my title was captain, doesn't mean I have everything figured out. If the Lord came right now, I wouldn't get the kingdom, and I can admit that. I'm a work in progress, and I pray the Lord continues to have mercy on me as I seek that perfection that Christ told me I can have through him. All right. So for me, uh, things became a lot different when I got married because now that's a whole different set of tribulations and trials. It could be someone that's by themselves and they just watch class online like that was me at the very beginning. It was a few of us. We met at the, at the library literally once a week. I didn't know what the hell the new moon was. I didn't know that there was high holy days we had to keep. I know anything. I just knew that there was a Sabbath. We came together at the library, watched class, and that was it. So we start to grow. We start to grow. We get a school. Then there's congregational trials that you go through. Those things can pull you out of the spirit, and those things can quench that fire to a certain degree. But understanding self-examination and being converted through God's laws is going to keep that confidence that you had in the beginning steadfast until the end. Understand that understand that from there let's go to back to revelations 2 verse 5 back to revelation 2 verse 5 all right really trying to nail this scripture home because this is the whole foundation of what this class is built on all right remembering your first love revelation 2 verse 5 it says Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. So remember the old person and the old man that you used to be. Listen, I give glory and praise to the Most High God every single day that, that he chose me out of the life that I was living to come and administer his word to his people. Like, it still blows my mind because I know the things that I was in the midst of, and I know the things that I'm capable of if I don't have these commandments to guide me a certain way. I mean, I have these commandments now, and I still jump off the spirit. So I'm I'm fully aware of how wicked I can be and how wicked my people can be. So to know that the Lord still was like, you know what? I'm choosing you to come administer the truth to his people that he called his firstborn, his only begotten. That's something that I can't take lightly, and that's why I have to self-examine and remember my first love and come back and serve him in truth. But it says, and do the first works. Do the things that you were doing in the very beginning. Do those things and continue doing those things because it's those, it's the, it's, it's the milk that you apply. Listen, people come to me and say, hey, you have any meat? I'm like, sure, you want some meat? Psalms 111 verse 10. That's the heaviest scripture in the Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all they that have a good understanding keep his commandments. That's the heaviest scripture in the entire Bible. You know why? Because two-thirds of our people are going to die because they don't understand it. There, that's your meat. People think because you get promoted to a captain, they put you in a room, and they're like, all right, listen, here's the breakdown of, of this, and here's Daniel this and Daniel that. Listen, all the wisdom I've obtained, I've been very fortunate. To break ground in different countries with the bishop and deacons and different captains to travel to you know this place and that place and be amongst these men and hear things through conversation but i've never been sat down and told all right are you ready to get this uh 12 feathers breakdown you, you ready for this meat no it's the milk that you apply god would be a liar if he said that you must apply the commandments to get a good understanding and then you've been applying the commandments to the best of your ability, and you still can't get color scripture one. You're like, oh, damn, I still can't see that Christ is black. God would be a liar then, right? All the wisdom I've obtained is just through me just applying the simple basic commandments, not reaching outside of my, my comfort zone as far as teaching even. That's why all my classes are about self-examination, God's laws, those those types of things. I'll leave the deep stuff for the people that that are in those positions to teach those things. All right. But it says, or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So he stresses yet again, except you repent, I'm going to remove these things. All right. 
from there, let's go to Proverbs 13 and verse 5. Proverbs 13 and verse 5. Let me see. Proverbs 13, verse 5. My 13 kind of looks like an 18, so let me see if that's what I want. Proverbs 13, verse 5. No, Proverbs 13, verse 9. I'm sorry. Proverbs 13 and verse 9. It says, The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. So Christ told us, listen, unless you repent and do the, the your first works, then I'm going to remove your candlestick. Meaning he's going to remove that spirit from you that was so zealous in the beginning to serve the Lord that you let the cares of the world creep in and slowly pull you out of the spirit. He says, I'm going to remove those things not from you. Understand that once one spirit is taken, it has to be replaced with something else. Look at King Saul as the ultimate example. He was the first king of Israel. His righteous spirit was taken and it was replaced with an evil spirit. It says the light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. So you're going to endure for a supposition of time. But if you're half stepping in this walk, then you're going to be identified and you're going to be removed completely. You're going to be removed completely. But that's why it says the lamp of the righteous rejoices because you rejoice knowing that all these things are just temporary. All these things are temporary. Listen, I'll be the first person to say that I don't like my job. My job is extremely easy, and I get paid very well to do what I do, but I just don't like the people that I work for. It's monotonous. It's slow. It's boring. But then I have to tell myself, man, I'm getting paid this much money to do this trivial thing, and I have a complaint about that? Like, really? Knowing that the Lord provided me a means to obtain the chief things in life to provide for me and my wife, and I have a problem with that, I'm like, oh, man, let me check my damn spirit. Hate not laborious work that the, that the Lord hath ordained. I mean, Christ had a job. Jesus Christ had a job. The, the Son of God had a job. And for me to be like, oh, I hate my job, it's like, bro, like, listen, not only did Christ have a job, but he also died for you. To be ungrateful about your job that you have? Ugh. Listen, everything that we do, we have to do as unto the Lord. All right? Remember that. Everything we do, we do as unto the Lord. Again, knowing that it's temporary. I have really a-hole bosses that are just pompous Edomites. That this are real cocky and just talk to you any kind of certain way. And I'm like, hmm. As much as I would like to, I can't. But on that day, every knee shall bow. And I have to remind myself, listen, this is just temporary. This this is this is my fault. That's why I tell myself, I can't be mad at them for enjoying their kingdom. This is their kingdom. And then I, then I tell myself, okay, all right, hey, live it up. And I just go on with, with my business. That's it. Let's, let's go to Psalms 51 and verse 10. Psalms 51 and verse 10. Let's get a little bit from King David. Psalms 51 verse 10. Also, in preparing to atone, all right, uh, Psalms 51 is an excellent chapter to read, all right? This is uh, the, the prayer that David had threw up when he was repenting unto the Lord. So this is one of the things that he said in it. Psalms 51 verse 10. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. So every single one of our spirits was defiled prior to coming into this truth. We were all following the ways and customs of the heathen, doing the things that felt right unto us. Christianity is no different from being a freaking atheist. All right. Atheists say, do as thou wilt. Christianity says, come as you are. It's the same thing. All right. It's sinning under a different title. That's all it is. But David understood, listen, I need you to create a new spirit within me because the spirit that, that, that's within me is not right. So I need 
to discipline myself with your laws because that's the only way that I can get right. Verse 11, it says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See what King David understood? King David understood that at any moment, the Lord can take that spirit from you. And if he takes that spirit from you, it's going to be replaced with a different spirit. It's going to be replaced with a different spirit. So there's a balance with God. There is good and there is evil. If you have a righteous spirit and he takes that, it's not going to be replaced with a kind of righteous spirit that has evil tendencies because that's confusion with the Lord. That righteous spirit is going to be taken and it's going to be replaced with an evil one. And then you're eventually going to be rooted out of this truth. So in meditating and understanding where you fall short and examine yourself and coming back to your first love and serving God who loved you above all nations. So now we have to choose him as our first love. Understand that at any moment he can just whoop, and that should put fear in any single last one of us. Every single last one of us are not worthy of the mercy that we're shown, but through the contract that we have signed with his son's blood, he said, okay, I'm going to allow you to come back unto me and serve me. That's why when people say ignorant things, I'm like, oh, my goodness, you don't understand the judgment that's going to come for these things. From there, let's go to 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Second Timothy two verse fifteen. It says, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." So we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. First and foremost, we need to understand that, that we're studying to show ourselves approved unto God. It's not to boast and brag about whatever knowledge and precepts that we were, um, obtained. There's a brother, won't say his name, but we were all still really new to the truth. And there's a brother that would tell us a scripture, but he wouldn't quote the, where the scripture was. He would just say, Oh, hey, I found the scripture that says this. And we would say, well, where's it at? And he'd say, study. Study. If you studied, if you study, then uh, you would know. And I'm like, this is some, some evil. Sh like, that's evil. Like, for real. Like, first off, the scripture says, don't withhold good things. So I gave him that scripture and shut that down completely. I'm like, okay, let, yeah, exactly. Give me the precept now, bro. But listen. You don't study that way you can go around bragging to other people. Oh, man, so I know this breakdown and that breakdown. Who cares? Who cares? There won't be a, a line awaiting the kingdom of who knew what precepts and what breakdowns. It's going to be how you conducted yourself in coordinates with God's laws and the faith of his son. So when we study, it's show ourselves approved unto God. It's not that you sit down... And you and you and you're and you're reading the book of Timothy's and you're like, oh, see, see, God, I'm studying. So now I'm approved. No, you're studying the things that you need to work on and in yourself to be built up in the spirit to obtain the kingdom of heaven. People think, OK, well, it's a study to show us approved. OK, well, then let me just read a couple of chapters of Genesis. No, you don't understand nothing that you just read, because first off. Genesis is the hardest book in the Bible, all right? It's not just picking up the book and just being like, okay, well, so, I, so I read this today, all praises. But then you go outside and smoke a cigarette or you go do whatever manner of sin that, that, that you commit. When you study, it's to combat the lust that's within you that you need to shun away to ensure that you're striving for the kingdom of heaven. From there, let's go to Galatians 1 verse 10. Galatians 1 verse 10. 
every Christian's favorite book. Read Galatians. I've heard that so many times in this walk. You have no idea. Like, <laughs> are those fringes? Have you read Galatians? And I'm like, oh, gosh. Yes, I have read Galatians. Thank you. At this point now, if it's not if it's not my people saying stupid stuff, I don't even entertain it. If it's if it's Esau or the other nations, I'm just like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. This is foolish, huh? Right. Well, well, we'll see. Galatians one verse ten. It says, "For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ." So understand this. In this walk, we're not meant to be men pleasers. We're supposed to study the scriptures daily and study for ourselves to see if those things are true and to be approved unto God. If you're doing this to be seen of men, then you have your reward already. Christ made that very clear when he wrote, when he, when he, when he said things in the spirit through the four uh, gospels. If you want to be seen of men, boom. You have your reward. That's great. You have a title that says captain. You can grow a real long beard. Fantastic. That's your reward then. That's not the reward that I want. Look, look there was no rank. There was no positions. There was no no schools even when, when I first. There was one school when I first came into the truth, and that was New York. That was it. Other than that, it was just little, little people here and there that were just watching class online. All right. Monday nights used to be taught by Deacon Nathan, and class used to be so small. It'd be like eight of us, eight or ten of us. That was it. And anyone that has seen Deacon Nathan teach knows that he brings the fire. Right. He, he brings it out to a point to where you give him a blank canvas and he draws you the most vivid, detailed picture and you get it. You get it right away. He would teach class to be like ten of us. And. He had everyone's number, so if you weren't on class for some reason, he'd call you and be like, hey, what are you doing? How come you're not on class? Oh, I had, was home, all the way home from work, and I had to stop at Walmart real quick to get some groceries for, uh, for um, you know, for dinner. Okay, well, hurry up and get on class. Man, you know how people would love, would absolutely love for the deacon, I thought, to call them? And say, hey, what are you doing? Get on class now. But now we've grown to a level that it's like, nah, no, 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 no. But with us growing to this level, all praise to the most high in Christ, that we're now able to have all these men readily accessible to be able to give us counsel and guidance. That way we don't lose sight of the mission. That we, we that way we can remember our first love. Let's go to Sirach 2, verse 16. Sirach 2, verse 16. So it says. That we we shouldn't seek to please men, but we should seek to please God, right? Study ourselves approved unto God. Sirach 2, verse 16. Sirach 2, verse 16. It says, They that fear the Lord will seek that which is well pleasing unto him so they that fear the lord will do what's well will seek what's well pleasing unto him to seek something means you're looking for it. if you're looking for it that means you're looking where where he says to look in the scriptures and you're doing what's well pleasing unto him because remember that's why we started in exodus he loved us first so now he's so we understand that he's our first love what do we do that's going to be pleasing unto him that way, as a father, he can look upon us as his children and then be proud. It says, and they that love him shall be filled with the law. And they that love him shall be filled with the law. The Bible was so redundant, it's ridiculous. It comes back to the same two things from Genesis 101 to Revelation 22, 21. It's the same things over and over and over again that God's only dealing with the nation of Israel, the so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, no matter what the gainsayers say, that's the 12 tribes of Israel. And number two, that we have to keep his laws. 
that we have to keep his laws, all right? Christianity has done a number on our people. And listen, I get it. I really do get it. Literally everything that I used to do, I don't do no more because I can't. Because guess what? It's a sin. So if I'm told, listen, you have to completely change your life, lose friends, lose family, lose jobs, lose materialistic things, and then discipline yourself and now learn to like all new things, or just say, I believe in Jesus Christ, most people are going to go with, I believe in Jesus Christ. But that's why Christ said, listen, I speak to them in parables because it's not meant for everybody. It's meant for you. So for those that have received it, all praise to the most high. But we have to ensure that we don't receive it for just a season, but that we're actually rooted in this. And we're making our calling and election sure. The Apocrypha is what's known as the hidden books. It's the books that was taken out of the King James Version Bible somewhere between the 17 and 1800s. There's different dates on that, but it's in the Bible. It was in the original G, uh, King James Version Bible, all right? Um, that can be an entire class on itself, but look it up, the Apocrypha, all right? It bridges many gaps, including of who the Gentiles are in the New Testament. So there's a reason why our oppressors wanted it out, all right? From there, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. I'm at that cut class a little short, um, but I have a few more scriptures left, all right? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. It says, and this I speak for your own profits, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Understanding this, that every single last one of us have something that tests our faith to the point that it becomes a distraction. And it's within yourself to understand what those distractions may be, all right? That's where the self-examination comes in. That's where the studying comes in. That's where understanding what triggers certain lusts within you come in. But we all have something within us, whether it be unbelieving family or friends or jobs or whatever the case may be, it's something, something, something. But it says, that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction, okay? Paul made it very clear to us that the main objective is to attend upon the Lord without distraction. Now, is there going to be distractions? Absolutely. Why? Because trials and tribulations are a part of this walk. Again, trials and tribulations are a part of this walk, and it's necessary in this walk for two reasons. One, because Christ made it very clear that through much tribulation will you get the kingdom of heaven. And two, because those tribulations are meant to work your patience, and your patience builds up your faith. So... It's all coupled together. It's all coupled together. Uh, let's get, let me see. Let's, let's go to Mark 10. Mark 10. No, I'm sorry. Mark 4. Mark 4. And let me see where I want to start. Let's go to Mark 4. And we'll start at verse, we'll start at verse 14, Mark 4, verse 14. All right, so those of you may be familiar with this particular parable that Christ gave, but this is the parable of the four types of Israelites, all right? It says, verse 14, the sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, 
where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word when it is sown from their hearts. So this is that first type of Israelite that doesn't even get a chance to even come into this and learn anything. They just hear their, that they're Israel, and then somehow Satan comes and then pulls them away immediately. It could be their phone rings when they're at camp and now they want to step away, or they're at camp listening, and then their, their heathen girlfriends pull them aside because she's upset that, well, where's white people on this sign? And they're not there. It could be whatever the case may be, but that's that first type of Israelite. Verse 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So then that second type of, of Israelite is that brother or sister that comes, and they're here for just a supposition of time. They're here. They're learning. They may come break bread and drink wine even. That's even some real scary stuff. If you come break bread and drink wine and not understanding the, the full severity of that, oof. Anyways. So it's that brother or sister that, that wasn't studying enough. They didn't remember their first love. They weren't searching the scriptures daily. They weren't examining themselves. So when persecution was coming, oh, you're in a hate group. Oh, you're in a cult. Uh, like me personally, I was told by my mother, listen, the lifestyle that I came out of, I used to do drugs, right? I was a massive whoremonger. I mean, I was into all manner of, of sin and foolishness. And then I come into this. And I'm working full time. I'm in college full time. Right. I went and got my degree. I got married. And my mother's response to that was, I hate that you found God. I like, really because I won't hit hit the blunt with you. One time for old time's sake, you're upset with me. You hate that I found God. I'm like, OK, but if I wasn't rooted and wasn't studied and wasn't reading the scriptures that say, listen, those are they of your own household. Those are the ones that are going to come against you first. If I didn't understand that and believe in that, then if I was this type of Israelite, then I, I would have been like, dang, man, mom, why would you say that? I'm your son. I'm fine here. Let me just once. And then I would have trimmed my ways to seek love. I would have entertained that sin, and I would have been rooted out eventually, right? Verse 18, it says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So that third type is someone that's here for a while, and they endure. They're enduring for a while, right? They're here. They're breaking bread. They're, they're shaloming. They're captains even. They're deacons even. Hey, they're even elders. But then the cares of other things creep in. And it says, and the deceitfulness of riches. That's why you can see some ignorant BS like Israel Unite in Commerce Facebook page being made. And miraculously, who was it made by? All the people that have left IUIC speaking evil, who all had businesses profiting on IUIC, now they're coming together. They make a a, a, a a page all selling their products. Really? Really? Come on. That's the deceitfulness of riches. They have crept in. So now they've made money their God versus making God their God, right? But it says... Verse 20, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. So this is that fourth type. This is the category that we all pray that we land in, that fourth type. Those of us that endure until the end, blesses he that endures. <clears throat> Christ says that because he understands it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a battle, and it should be. This ain't given just freely. But bless are you that endure, because the scripture says in, in, in Corinthians, eyes have not seen nor ears have heard the things the Lord has prepared for us, for those that come back and love him. So, ooh, bless may hey, bless you that endures, because listen, what my father has waiting, woo, 
it's worth it. It's worth it. But we as people, we like to, if it's not tangible, we can't see it, we can't feel it, then we don't believe in it. Although the curses we can see in the Bible, slave ships came to pass, yokes of iron came to pass. We see those things throughout history, but we weren't there for those things. So then we still like, mm, I don't know. But that's why we have to search the scriptures to build up our faith. From there, let's go to let's go to Hebrews 12, verse 6. Hebrews 12, verse 6. All right. Understanding that trials and tribulations are a necessary part of this walk. It's a necessary part of this walk. And for me, and, and the easiest way that I can convey the message to all of you brothers and sisters that may be watching is that trials and tribulations do exactly what Paul said in the book of Romans, right? It works our patience. Um, it builds up our faith. But for me, it also lets me know that the Father is still dealing with me on some way, shape, or form. On some level, the Father is still dealing with me. When, when I'm going through tribulations and trials, then I know, okay, the Father's still working with me. Because if I was fully serving Satan, then then I, I'd be doing the things, then I, I would be blessed, right? Because we know that Satan has has the ability to give blessings as well, right? So Hebrews 12 and verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the, who the father chasteneth not? So if you endure that chastening, because, again, it's only for a supposition of time, then the Lord deals with you as sons. So although... When you're going through it at that particular time, it may not seem like the most comely thing ever. And listen, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. When I've gone through things, the first thing I do is not face the east and say, thank you, Father, for these trials and tribulations. Thank you for these things. Because at that time when you're going through it, you're like, damn, like again? But then when I come back into my right mind and I remember that these things are a sign that the Heavenly Father is still dealing with me, then, then I face the east and I say, Father, thank you for the chief things in life. Thank you for allowing me to wake up. Please have mercy on me tomorrow. To allow me to wake up tomorrow to continue to strive. And give me the patience to overcome these trials and tribulations and the spirit to take them on cheerfully when they do come upon me. For they will come upon me. From there, let's go to... Revelations 21, verse 3. Revelation 21, verse 3. The last scripture, and then I'm going to go ahead and end class. Revelation 21, verse 3. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God shall be with them and be their God. So when going through the trials and tribulations and all the things that come with being in this truth, understand that this is what we're doing it for. This is a part of the gift that we're going to receive from the Lord for being patient through those trials and tribulations and coming back and remembering our, our first love, knowing that we're going to be dwelling with God and his son in heaven forever. Verse four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So on that day and on that hour, when God himself grabs you brothers and sisters by your face and wipes away your tears and said, I did all those things to you. I did those things to you because I expected better from you. I, I knew that you knew better, but I had to chastise you because you're my son and you're my daughter. And I need you to remember your first love. And your first love needs to be me because I'm dad. That's what we do this for. That's why we overcome these trials and tribulations and sins. And we continue to press forward to the kingdom of God. For that day and that hour, for our father to wipe away our tears and to say, 
I'm proud of you for coming back and serving me. Now, this is your reward, everlasting life in the kingdom of God. All right. So with that, I'm going to say shalom. I pray the lesson was was edifying. I'm sorry I had to cut it short. Um, but yes, I pray it was um, edifying, family. Lord's will, I can be back on again sometime soon. Lord's will, life lasts. But um, I love this class. How often do you teach online? Um, you know what? Depending on my on my schedule, um, I'm supposed to teach online. Lord's will moving forward once a week. It's going to rotate like Wednesdays and then Fridays, Wednesdays, Fridays. So Lord's will once a week, I'll be able to be online. All right. So all praises to the Most High and the Son of Christ. All right. When you're going through the day, you're going through trials and tribulations and things like that. Hey, just remember, you're not Esau. All right. So with that, I say Shalom. Most High and Christ bless. Again, I'm Captain Amariah. Stay in the spirit of Israel. Shalom.